currently have, at least when she sent me this email, they had eight. Yes. And the rooster's name is Pebble. Is that all? Am I getting <laughs> right. all that right? Yeah. All right. So I wanted to get all the important stuff right up front. Yeah. Um, so questions about Pebble, you can save them uh, for the end. But um, uh, uh, Professor Titus works in philosophical and interdisciplinary studies in mind, intelligence, epistemology, and the ethics of AI and robotics. Um, her publications are in a variety of well-regarded journals, such as the Journal of Philosophy and Philosophical Studies. Uh, she has interdisciplinary uh, publications in venues such as Frontiers and Neurorobotics. Uh, so questions about Seven of Nine and uh, any other cyborgs. Also, <laughs> you can save that. Is your rooster a, a cyber, cybernetic? I, so as far as I know, he's a... Uh, biological research. Okay, all right. Um, her, uh, she's a recent recipient of a fellowship from the NEH uh, for, uh, for her book project, which is tentatively titled More Intelligent Agents Towards the Next Wave of Effective and Ethical Intelligence Research. In addition to her academic work, she is a faculty wellness advisor at Penn School of Arts and Sciences and an executive board member of the program in Gender, Women's, and Sexual Sexuality Studies. Her talk today is entitled Towards Understanding Intelligence, Avoiding Substitution Bias, Echo Chambers, and Philosophical Laundering. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elisa Meraki Titus. Well, thanks for that kind introduction. I'm super excited to be here today and to talk with you about this is a portion of my book project that I'll be presenting today. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's all, that's all I'll say about that. Oh, somebody's in the chat. Oh, okay. That's all. Um, since we're not a too large group, if there are kind of clarification questions as we go along, please feel free to ask them. Please save your devastating objections for the end. <laughs> all right, let's go. So, and I should go for about 50 minutes, is that? That's, yeah. that's fine, okay. um, that's fine. Okay. Uh, anyone who has a five o'clock class might be like at about 10 to okay. or so, but other than that, we're, we're here. Cool. Still fine. Okay, cool. Um, okay, let's see if this, there we go. Okay, um, so these are two of my favorite intelligence systems. These are my step kids. Uh, Noah and Neva, and they pop up in various places. Um, so here's the plan for the talk today. I'm going to make the case for what I call a stance of fractal emergence in intelligence research. And I'll clarify what I mean by this, but it's a methodological thesis. It's a thesis that we should treat intelligent kinds like perception and learning and knowledge and intention as humans and biological animals have it. We should treat those as though they are emergent when we're doing intelligence research. Um, so we shouldn't treat them as readily identifiable with say computational or other kinds of uh, non-mental, non-intelligence related kinds. I'm going to say nevertheless <laughs> that we can do rigorous scientific study of intelligence. And so what I'll do is I'll give you a framework that I've developed called the generative framework that explains how we can take this stance of practical emergence and it actually helps us understand the biological and potentially artificial bases of intelligent systems. Um, and then I will, uh, when I first designed this talk, I thought I would get the chance to talk about three pitfalls that I think we see in intelligence research and the talk was way too long. So I'm only gonna talk about one of them today. I'm gonna talk about echo chambers. So I think that there are lots of echo chambers between say neuroscience and computer science. And I'll talk a little bit about how the framework that I developed gets us out of that. And then lastly, I'll explain why all of this sort of techie philosophy of mind science stuff is not just sort of um, intellectually important or practically important in terms of designing and understanding these systems, but it's also ethically important. I think we have a, a different handle on the ethical issues once we see the sort of philosophy of intelligence uh, science side more clearly. Um, so the thing I want to focus on today is this, what I'll call is tendency to reductively identify 
intelligence related kinds that you see sort of throughout intelligence research. And it happens sort of without people even realizing it. So I'm gonna read the short passage from um, uh, a standard textbook on intelligence research by Russell and Norwig. And they say this, humans, it seems, know things. What they know helps them do things. These are not empty statements. They make strong claims about how the intelligence of humans is achieved, not by purely reflex me mechanisms, but by processes of reasoning that operate on internal representations of knowledge. In AI, this approach to intelligence is embodied in knowledge-based agents. So what I wanna point out here is that we start from this general claim that humans know things, and immediately we go to what are purportedly technical consequences of just the fact that humans know things, namely that knowledge is a matter of having a kind of internal computational representation um, that's stored in a certain kind of way that has certain kind of properties. And, um, and this jump is something that happens just in sort of the statement of the problem, the intelligence problem. And it's that that I want to resist. Humans know things for sure, and that's part of what it is to be intelligent. But knowledge is a relational thing. It's a relation between an agent and some fact that's known. What internal representations are involved or required for that, I think is an open empirical question. Uh, but this kind of tendency to reductively identify starts with the sort of intelligence vocabulary and immediately recharacterizes it in some kind of computational or representational vocabulary. Um, one way to sort of frame what happens here is that we slide between variable scales. So the way, um, I mean, with knowledge, it's clear, but I think that this is true with other intelligence related signs. Um, they are relationally characterized. So knowledge that P is a relation between an agent who's over here and the fact that P, they're related to the world in a certain kind of way. Or when you perceive, say, you know, I perceive David, it's a relation between me and David, first and foremost. The, the scale, the spatiotemporal scale at which the intelligence kind is articulated is larger than any sort of internal representations that might be inside of the head. And so um, it's not just spatiotemporal, <laughs> but that's part of it, right? So it seems like we're sliding between two different variable scales um, kind of by accident. <laughs> we're starting with this relational one between the agent and the world. And before we know it, we're ending up just inside of the brain or the agent's control system. Um, okay. So I'm interested in the question. So this, this thing that sort of this slip that tends to happen, I think glosses over what I think is the most interesting que question. How do you relate this relational agential characterization to what happens with internal representations? <clears throat> that I think is an open and critical question. So to get our way into, and the details of this, uh, the image don't, don't really matter for our purposes, but maybe I can, there. Yeah. That'll um, be easier for everybody to look at. So by way into, um, so you might, you might ask why, why should I be so careful about this sort of variable scale idea? When you think about seeing, yes, yeah, sure, it's relational, but can't you understand that in terms of having an internal perceptual experience and then what's so bad about thinking about it representationally and so on and so forth. And so what I wanna do now is motivate a little bit that we should be uh, careful <laughs> about um, not sliding between these variable scales. And I wanna take an analogy with thermoregulation. So thermoregulation is a biological capacity, the capacity of organisms. Um, it is importantly not just subserved by only one mechanism. There are multiple mechanisms for thermoregulation. There's vasodilation and constriction, there's panting, there's sweating. Uh, for some beings, they're moving into the shade or putting on a sweater, <laughs> right? And so the mechanisms for thermoregulation, uh, there are multiple and they need to be coordinated with each other in relation to the agent's environment in order to preserve this higher level robust capacity to thermoregulate that organisms have, right? This capacity for thermoregulation is something that can be selected for, right? And you would understand why, <laughs> because an organism that can't thermoregulate 
can't survive, right? Um, and it doesn't matter what the underlying mechanisms are as long as they subserve thermoregulation. And you would expect evolution to, to select for um, a relatively complex underlying structure where you have compensating mechanisms that might not be good individually all the time, but together are coordinated to preserve this higher level function across a large um, range of circumstances. Okay. Importantly, effective causal interventions at the lower level are not going to be uh, effective at the higher level, right? What it means for these mechanisms to be coordinated with each other is that if you knock one of them out, another one will step in, right? The fact that you knock out one mechanism isn't going to change whether the organism thermoregulates. The system is complex enough to be able to, at least in a wide range of circumstances. Um, these are often called violations of faithfulness in the causation literature. In the neuroscience literature, they're called degeneracy, which I think is you know, not as positive a name for this thing. It's actually, I think, a really important phenomenon that we find um, when we have these important organism level capacities like thermoregulation. Um, so the first point that I wanna make today is if thermoregulation is this complicated, why should we expect intelligence to be any simpler? So there's this tendency to think that we can understand what it is to know that P in terms of one unitary internal representation or what it is to reason that, like reason from P and Q to R in terms of one unitary algorithm. But why think that it would be that simple when something as basic as thermoregulation is much more complicated? Um, I'm gonna... Yes, I'll say something briefly about this. This is like, I couldn't help but put the slide in. It's kind of the, the key concept of the book, which isn't super important for our purposes today, but in case you're wondering like, why am I so motivated uh, by this? Um, I think that when we give, when we talk about something like reasoning, um, I don't know, reasoning that you need your coat from looking outside and seeing that it's snowing and slushy, right? Um, that's a non-deductive inference. It's a contentful inference. Um, and I really believe that intelligent systems are sensitive to contents and how we reason and what we do. I call this concept semantic efficacy. I think our contents themselves are genuinely causally efficacious. Um, and part of the book project is to make good on what that means and so on. Um, but if you are just trying to understand reasoning in terms of internal processes, and this is where I'm jumping over a lot, I could give a whole talk on just this, but just to give you kind of the, what's motivating me here, the, if you carve off the external world and just look at internal processes, those carve off the content. Algorithms are statable in formal terms. Like the states and processes have content, but you can state the causal functioning independently of, of content. And so this is why I care so much about this, this distinction between variable scales is I think that the semantic one <laughs> is this relational one. It's the one that relates us to the world and has to do with our meaningful engagement with the world. Whereas the formal internal uh, characterizations are inherently not, <laughs> not meaningful um, in the sense of you know, the kinds of worldly contents that we're normally involved with. So, um, that's sort of why I care so much about this. I think intelligent systems meaningfully engage with their environments in the fullest sense. And it's not, it's an open question whether there could be artificial systems that do that. But an artificial system that does that is one that um, has systems that are kind of like thermoregulation, but they're for intelligence. So you have these complex mechanisms that are coordinated with the body and the environment to get this meaningful engagement with the world. That's the future. Okay, so why, this is sort of the last sort of piece of setup about um, thinking about how to think about intelligence and why you might think of it uh, in this kind of way. I think we can make the case that we should expect, just like in the, in the thermoregulation example, we can understand why evolution would have selected for systems that thermoregulate robustly across a wide range of circumstances 
and so have this sort of complex underlying structure. We can understand that because it's so important for survival. But um, I think intelligence kinds, it's important that they're robust in the same kind of way. So uh, a system that can genuinely interact with whatever it is that's important for survival and fitness in her environment is going to be more robust than one that acts just on an internal representation of that thing. So the way to think about it is that the internal representation has content because the sort of internal cognitive system is set up to um, uh, have some sort of structural similarity to what's in the world, right? So it's because um, you have your internal representations that um, the sort of internal transition from one to another mirrors something that happens in the world that makes the system effective in pursuing its own system. Um, like a famous example is, you know, bacteria represent the direction of up um, in terms of the oxygen, uh, amounts of oxygen, so certain bacteria can do that, right? So the thing that they can detect is the amount of oxygen and that's a representation for the directionality, right? But if you put them in a tank where the direction of oxygen is shifted some way, they're not gonna know up from down, right? So that's an example where re representations are inherently brittle. If you have a system that acts on internal representations, you need the right setup where that representation reflects the thing that in the environment that's adapted. And in uncertain and changing environments like ours, that's going to be precarious pretty much always. So in terms of survival and reproduction, one would expect evolution to select for systems that can genuinely engage with the features in their environment that are important for survival and reproduction. And what does that mean? That means that their behavior isn't determined by just one representation. It's probably determined by a suite of representations that are coordinated with each other and the body and the environment so that you get this robust, higher level intelligent engagement with the world. That's the picture. So, um, oh, I forgot to say one more thing, which is, um, and because this is, I'm presenting a book project, there are like, there's more to say sort of at every single point here, and I'm happy to talk more about it in Q&A. But one of the things that I think is really important is how ubiquitous um, these kinds of relational characterizations, these relational content involving characterizations of intelligence systems are, right? So from common sense uh, explanations to like, um, Neva saw the pelican, so she walked to the edge of the beach, right? Where you have this relational seeing and then this relational doing. Um, to um, uh, scientific explanations in the social sciences, where we appeal to people's preferences and interests to explain what they do. Um, these kinds of content involving relational characterizations of intelligent systems are ubiquitous and uh, attempts to sort of explain them away <laughs> Um, have met with a lot of difficulty, right? And so there have been sort of ebbs and flows where people get really excited about certain kinds of like, say, uh, neuroscientific reductions of terms in economics. And then there's a die off because those projects don't seem to pan out as well as we would have, we would have liked. So I think when we talk about um, meaningful characterizations of intelligent behavior, there's a robust both common sense, but also scientific, um, uh, uh, system that provides these generalizations and checks them and so on. And so we should take them, take them seriously. Okay. So um, the claim that I want to hone in on today is the idea of practical emergence as a methodological thesis. So um, as far as I know in the literature, people mostly focus on emergence as either uh, metaphysical thesis or an epistemic or explanatory thesis. So um, if you're thinking about it as a metaphysical thesis, there's sort of a stronger and a weak version. There's the, the strong version is that these higher level kinds are ontologically distinct from the lower level kinds. Um, weak emergence is that they're 
distinct from uh, distinct from the lower level kinds, but they inherit all their causal power, so they don't have any of their causal power. I'm going to remain neutral for today on metaphysical questions, right? I, you know, to sort of pull back the curtain, I lean towards the sort of strong emergent side of things metaphysically. But what I have to say today actually doesn't depend on that. Um, as an epistemic or explanatory thesis, the idea is that we can't hire, so the strong thesis is that higher level kinds can't be explained in terms of lower level kinds at all. Um, the sort of weak explanatory emergence thesis is the claim that higher level kinds can't be um, explained via some sort of transparent explanation, but rather maybe you can give simulations that explain higher level kinds or something like that. We have some sort of, um, you're not going to be able to derive the higher level kinds or their causal powers from lower level kinds, but you're going to be able to somehow uh, simulate and therefore explain higher level behavior. Um, to sort of, you know, lay my cards on the table, I go for a kind of, um, in some ways, a kind of weak explanatory thesis. I think that we can explain um, higher level kinds in terms of lower level kinds. And I'm gonna say something about how I think that should be done. Um, but the thing that I'm, I most care about, that I think is most important, is that we should adopt emergence as a practical methodological thesis, where we don't assume that this kind of strong explanatory um, project of defining higher level kinds in terms of lower level kinds is possible. We don't assume that we can give some sort of uh, definition, say, of what it is to learn in terms of some kind of algorithm, right? Or we don't assume that we can characterize what it is to perceive in terms of some kind of representation of the result of sensory processing. That is what I think is really important. And that's what I think is tripping up a lot of intelligence research is that they take the sort of practical reductionism <laughs> as sort of a given in intelligence research. And I wanna argue for a kind of practical emergence. If at the end of the day, I turn out to be wrong and we can define higher level kinds in terms of lower level kinds, that's great. But that's the result of inquiry, not the starting point. So, let me say a little bit about what it means to take a stance of practical emergence in scientific intelligence research. The way that I like to think about it is, um, so I am taking some advances that have been made in the causal explanation research in the last 20 years or so. I wanna take those insights and leverage them to another domain. So, Causal explanations explain how things depend on what goes before as, as you go through time, how things later in time depend on what goes before. What I call generative explanations explain how higher level kinds obtain in virtue of lower level kinds, or um, uh, equivalently, how lower level kinds organize to give rise to higher level kinds. So, um, a big advance that I think has been made in the last 20 years or so is to focus on causal difference making. So instead of the sort of traditional mid 20th century um, model, which is called the deductive nomological model, that model says um, you sort of have your laws, you have your laws uh, that science gives you, you have your particular instances, and then you can deduce the effect from the particular information. That um, that kind of approach, uh, the deductive nomological approach, that approach locates the explanatory power of these kinds of scientific explanations in prediction. And so the idea is that you have this law and it allows you to predict, predict the instances if you have some, some information about your particular situation. Um, but it doesn't make any claims about dependence, about what makes what happen. Right. And this cool and I think pretty big revolution in thinking about scientific explanation that's occurred over the last 20 years or so, um, led by, uh, especially by Jim Wood Woodward's work. Um, he has a 2003 book, Making Things Happen, where he motivates this kind of interventionist account. And 
Michael Strabens also I sort of locate in this camp um, with his pyretic account. Um, they say, actually, what's, uh, what we want to know is what made a difference to what. So when we explain uh, why the shadow is so long from the height of the flagpole, it's because the height of the flagpole caused the shadow to be a certain length, given that the sun was in that position, and not the reverse, right? The length of the shadow doesn't explain the height of the flagpole. It's the other way around. Why? Because the one made the other. So there's a kind of asymmetry to our explanatory practices um, that people like Woodward and Strebens and so on want to capture. Um, so their thought is what we're actually doing that, of course, prediction is important, but the real explanatory power is to model these difference making relationships. You want to accurately describe a system where you describe what makes a difference to what. So um, a nice thing about this kind of view is that they're often context, context specific. So um, in contrast with the deductive nomological model, you're not sort of making your laws as general as possible. That's not where the explanatory power often comes from. Often, especially when you're talking about biological systems or other higher level systems, um, the explanations have to be context specific. You, you can't get that much generality. But if you're accurately describing the causal difference makers, that's no mark against your explanation. Um, there are lots of sophisticated modeling tools that get used for um, representing these kinds of difference making relationships. Um, and they allow us to specify complex structure and um, understand things like compensating mechanisms. So over here, I have, um, uh, it's, this is called a directed acyclic graph um, where, uh, the, this is sort of a famous philosophy of causation example. Um, if you take birth control, it uh, raises your risk of thrombosis. No, it lowers your risk of thrombosis uh, directly, but it raises it via um, lowering your risk of, wait, no, it raises, sorry, back up. It raises your risk of thrombosis directly but it lowers it by lowering, lowering the probability that you'll get pregnant, right? So birth control makes a difference to whether or not you get pregnant and pregnancy is a risk for a risk condition for thrombosis. So you lower it that way, but you raise it directly um, by taking the birth control pills. And so this kind of directed acyclic graph represents these relationships. So then you can understand how there would be a causal relationship between taking birth control and whether you have thrombosis, even though the straight counterfactual is uh, um, doesn't align. Like if I were to stop taking birth control, I would get thrombosis, that's false, right? There's no difference between whether I take birth control or not. So um, this is a kind of causal counterbalancing mechanism, right? But what we're interested in, so, so this kind of approach is good for understanding those kinds of but we're also interested in this kind of generative counterbalancing mechanism, right, with thermoregulation, right? So we're interested in thinking about um, counterbalancing underlying features that preserve higher level function. So the idea roughly is that we can basically transport what people have been um, uh, developing for causal explanation to the generative case, to the case of understanding how lower level kinds give rise to higher level kinds. And so this is the way that I suggest that we do it. So basically, I, I, I think about generative explanation as a sort of three model framework where you have three coordinated models. There's the agent model, which states in its own vocabulary, um, uh, the kinds of generaliza explanatory generalizations that we're interested in. So it might give you a model of the relationship between perception and reasoning and action <laughs> for a certain kind of system. Or um, uh, it might explain certain features about the relationship between competing desires and what you end up doing and so on and so forth. So the agent or emergent model is the model of the thing, the higher level thing that you're trying to understand. You're trying to understand how it could be 
um, implemented in terms of more fundamental kinds. Then there's the basis model, and this is where um, the computationalists get their heyday. <laughs> you know, is that I want I want to totally accept that there are important algorithms and internal representations that go on. They're just part of the story that underlies um, intelligent cognition and behavior. So the basis model will include things like um, machine learning models, um, in addition to the relation between that and bodily and environmental features. Um, but that is stated in non-mental, non-intelligence involving vocabulary, right? So we can think about the agent model as the one that is stated in, in proprietary intelligence related vocabulary. The basis model is um, a model of the underlying processes of the system that's stated in non-mental, non-intelligence involving vocabulary, either intel, uh, computational vocabulary or mechanical, electrical vocabulary, something like that. And then there's what I want to call the generative model, which is like these causal models but instead relates the um, generative difference makers, features of the basis model to features of the agent model. So it helps us understand what features make a difference to, um, uh, to this, the manifestation of intelligent cognition. And, and um, let's see, do I have, no, I don't have that slide. So um, importantly, Right. If we're thinking about generative models as sort of on the mo on, on the model of these causal models, then we can think about part of what we're representing is the counterbalancing of underlying mechanisms. That's going to be an important part of the story. So we're particularly interested in preserving higher level robust functioning, and um, we can have partial mechanisms. But a big part of what we want to know is how they're related to each other in the body and the environment to preserve higher level function. Okay. That's the, that's the generative framework. I hope that this um, makes it compelling that when we, when we take the methodological stance of practical emergence, we're not giving up on rigorous science or engineering on AI. In fact, the opposite. We're pulling apart two things that often get completed so that we can scientifically study them, right? So instead of assuming that what it is for an agent to know that P is a matter of having certain internal representations as a P, we ask that empirical question. And when we take a kind of gen generative approach to intelligence research, we end up being able to articulate empirical questions that people are not asking because they're sort of collapsing these variable scales. So a thing that I did in collaboration with some um, roboticists at Penn, uh, Dan Kodacek and his former student, uh, Sonia Roberts, is we did a kind of analysis of a lot of the work on like a um, locomotion that's been done in his lab um, from a kind of generative perspective. So we wanted to look at um, uh, whether, so um, one, of, one of the things that makes this collaboration between me and uh, Dan Kodacek so fruitful is that he's also skeptical of needing these robust internal representations to perform certain kinds of agential tasks. So he tries to make his robots as stupid as possible and to see, see what they can do. Um, and so um, we both approach things from a, with a kind of um, uh, empirical sort of approach to what internal representations are needed. So Sonia's idea was that we could sort of think about, um, articulate a thing that Dan Kodacek is doing through the lens of the generative framework by thinking about um, Gibsonian affordances. So uh, JJ Gibson was a, um, a psychologist and a philosopher of perception. And he thought that perception was in the first instance a matter of perceiving opportunities for action. These are affordances. So you perceive the graspability of the pointer, the climbability of the stairs, and so on. This project is less on perception, but we're interested in these kinds of affordances. There are things a robot can do. So things a robot can do might be, you know, climbing the stairs or um, standing on uneven terrain in certain kinds of ways and so on. So these are affordances. And in the robotics literature, people who work on affordances assume 
that we have to perceptually represent them in order for the robot to be able to act on them. That's sort of like the, the reductive assumption in the robotics literature is that if you're gonna get a robot to exploit an affordance, well, it's gotta be able to internally represent it. That's what it is to exploit it. It has a representation and then it has code that tells you what to do based on that representation of that affordance. But we thought that actually in many cases you can get robots to um, at least in certain constrained environments, ex do something like exploiting affordances without those internal representations. So one example um, is that we, um, so we had six case studies in this paper. One example was um, standing on uneven terrain, right? So one thing, when you spend time around roboticists, um, it's really cool, like the things that seem so basic but are so difficult, right? And one of these is having a robot that doesn't burn out its motors when it's on uneven terrain. Um, because uh, if all the motors are going at the same, uh, the same rate, that's extremely um, inefficient. So what Johnson and all 2012 did is that they built a kind of reactive uh, landscape that described the energetic costs. And then they could infer just from the current draw on the motors what the optimal um, energetic um, output of each of the motors should be. So the point here, the technical details don't really matter. The point is that you don't need an objective representation of the terrain at all. You don't need a representation of yourself and what, uh, what effort you need to, um, to uh, exert in that terrain. All you need is an internal representation of the current drop from your own motors. And that's the representation that allows you to exploit the affordance in that condition. So what's the point? The point is that when we take a kind of practical emergence approach, what we end up finding is that in many cases, there are more local representations that will do the job in specific circumstances. Now, the robot can't really exploit the affordance of standing on uneven terrain for all sorts of terrain or all sorts of environments. So it's not robust in the way that genuinely intelligent systems are. But when we start to think about how we would build such a system, the way I think we should start thinking about it is in terms of not looking for the one unitary representation of the affordance, but looking in each context, what are the representations that are needed in order to get the job done in that context? And then how are they coordinated so that when you shift contexts, the robot is using the correct representations for that context? So what we get is a kind of distinction between the underlying representations that are useful for the intelligent or intelligent approaching behavior in that circumstance. You may never get lower level representations that have the same content as the higher level intelligent meaningful engagement. Um, representations are still important, but it's an open empirical question what they are, why we, when we need them, why we need them, and what their contents are. Um, so I think it's helpful already sort of preliminarily to help roboticists understand the logical space of the problems that they're trying to solve. Okay, the next thing I want to do is talk about, um, oh, let me say one more thing. So um, you know, AI and machine learning is seeing a heyday right now, and it's really exciting. There's lots of really cool stuff going on. And the next thing I'll talk about is a, an example of machine learning. But um, there's uh, something about the kind of methodological approach of the uh, machine learning people that I think has not been adequately appreciated. So in contrast with the sort of good old fashioned AI symbolic people who were, you know, these hardcore um, reductionists who thought, you know, thinking is basically, you know, doing logic and we can get computers to do logic. So thinking is just a matter of manipulating the right symbolic representations, right? That's sort of the good old fashioned AI approach that, um, that failed because it's too hard. It just, it didn't work. Um, the connectionists instead were a little more open-minded even from the get-go. And they thought, well, let's not assume that the goal of learning is the formulation of certain kinds of explicit rules that can be symbolically represented. Let's just get the thing to act as though it knows the rules. And that is um, a sort of 
you're leaving open what it is, what underlying implementation it is that makes the system act as though it makes the rules, right? And so we can see, even, you know, there we can see in this initial sort of formulation from the 80s of um, the sort of connectionist um, approach that you have this sort of conception, which I would call that, uh, you know, a, a sketch of an agent model of what it is to act as though you know the rules, you learn the rules. And then it's an empirical question what the underlying representations are that, um, that get you a system that acts as though it knows the rules. So I think that even though there are lots of places where connectionists and um, deep learning people sort of move away from this initial motivation, I think it's actually very sympathetic to a, a, um, the way that they tend to think about problems. So um, I know part of, part of this project is a little bit critical, um, but I think it's sort of, oh, I'm trying to articulate something that I think is already there in, in some of this research and help, help people um, develop it and expand it into something really productive. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, let me just for the sake of time, let me just skip this. So, how does this kind of um, stance of practical emergence, this kind of generative approach, how does it help us um, avoid what I see as echo chambers? that happen in intelligence research. And here's what I mean by echo chambers. They're where certain ideas get reinforced, not because they get actual empirical support, but because uh, people can easily talk to each other, right? So um, it's not surprising once you point it out that people who are reductive computationalists in cognitive science can easily talk to people who are reductive computationalists in AI and engineering because they're both using computational models of the same thing. So a concern I have is that you get these echo chambers where people are reinforcing the idea that um, you can have these kinds of reductive computational models, not because there's actual empirical evidence for this, but just because it's easy to talk to each other. And that's something that I think really happens a lot. So um, here's an example of a, a case where this happens. And, um, I like to pick on people that I really respect, <laughs> you know, so everybody in here is somebody who's really smart. And when I say that they're, you know, making us a, a slip or a, um, a slide, it's not, it's, you know, I'm not saying that it's trivial. Um, these are really hard issues. But what I want to point out again is the way we slide so quickly between the sort of human level characterization of intelligence and some sort of computational articulation of what, what we think we're talking. So this is a paper by uh, Demis Hassabis et al, who is um, one of, I think he's, I forget his title, but he's like one of the leaders of DeepMind, Google DeepMind. And he published a paper with some colleagues in 2017, arguing that AI research needs more neuroscience. Right. Completely on board with that, by the way. <laughs> but um, what, how the paper starts, I'm just gonna read you a little, a little part of this paper. So he says, uh, they say, we begin with the premise that building human level general AI is a daunting task um, because the search space of possible solutions is vast and likely only very sparsely populated, right? We argue that this therefore underscores the utility of scrutinizing the inner workings of the human brain, the only existence proof that such an intelligence is even possible. So they start out their paper by saying, let's look at human level artificial intelligence um, uh, when we're trying to build genuinely intelligent systems that have intelligence like humans do. We should be looking at humans. <laughs> we should be looking at the human brain and how it works. And that might help us understand how, um, how to build an intelligent system. The only existence, so there's already one slip here, right? So humans are the only existence proof of um, intelligent systems. I think animals are too, but humans and animals, right? Are the only existence proofs. Uh, we're intelligent, so somehow, at least if you take a physicalist stance like I do and like the people in this paper do, um, we, intelligent systems must be able to be built out of more fundamental systems and processes. 
Um, but then they jump straight to when they, like in the next paragraph, when they're more precisely formulating their claims, they say, um, what we're interested in is a systems neuroscience level understanding of the brain, namely the algorithms, architectures, functions, and representations it utilizes. This roughly corresponds to the top two levels of Mars three levels of analysis, the computational level and the algorithmic level. So what they do is they, the details are not super important. What they do is that they jump from talking about humans as being worthy of study because we're, along with animals, the only existence of groups of genuine intelligence to, well, the thing to study is computational representations of the brain. Right. And so they're trying to use neuroscience to get a more influx of um, ideas and inspiration into AI research, but they're already so specific in the way they're thinking about it, that they're only going to look basically at computational models that reinforce certain basic assumptions that are in AI. And the rest of the paper, you can take my word for it. Does, that's what it does. It does, it does this. So um, even when people are when people are calling for interdisciplinary research, they're often doing it with this mindset of just thinking about computational models to go back and forth. Um, as a, an example of how this works in practice, um, I want us to think about um, the example of algorithms like word to vec or uh, other sort of vector representations. What these, um, these are, these vector representations are the results of machine learning. And basically what you do is you feed a neural net data about um, how likely a certain word is in relation to, sorry, um, you feed it a word and you try to, you train it up so that it can guess what word's gonna come next, right? So over here we have like the word that we're uh, feeding it. And then, um, oh, this one is uh, asking what words came before. There are a bunch of, bunch of different systems, but you want it to be able to predict the words that came before. So you train up and, and you basically say, yes, you did a good job or no, you did a bad job. And over many, many iterations, you train up a big vector representation, which has your vocabulary in it. It has all of the, uh, and so you have a similarity metric to each other word in your vocabulary. So you can think about um, uh, the relations, sort of each word being a point in this vector space. Um, okay. um, so why should we care about these vector representations? Well, it turns out you can do some kind of interesting things with them. So people have claimed that you can do analogical reasoning with them. You can take the vector for Germany, add the vector for Berlin, subtract the vector for France, and what do you get? A vector for Paris, right? So it's as though you're reasoning like Germany is to Berlin as France is to Paris using these vector representations. So people in psychology, oh, there we go, um, have wondered whether vector representations might be able to shed light on heuristic reasoning. Like maybe these vector representations can reveal something about analogical reasoning or heuristic reasoning more generally than humans. So um, a paper by Sudhi Bhatia, um, who's also at Penn in psychology, uh, suggests that we can use vector, these kinds of vector representations to help us understand what's going on in the Linda Van Teller problem. So just as a kind of quick reminder, um, the Linda Bank Teller case is uh, one where you sort of read this description of Linda. So she's 31, single, outspoken, bright, majored in philosophy. As a student, she's concerned with discrimination and social justice, and she participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. And then you ask them to pick from a list the thing that Linda most likely is. And on that list is that she's a bank teller and that she's a feminist bank teller, among other things. People reliably. Although uh, philosophy students, students who've taken logic are really good at this. 
uh, actually not not making this mistake, but people are um, reliably say it's more likely that she's a feminist bank teller than that she's a bank teller. Mm -hmm. But of course that's impossible, right? Because all feminist bank tellers are bank tellers, right? So they're not using logic or probability <laughs> to do this. They're doing something else. So what are they doing? So that's the, that's the Linda bank teller problem. Um, so Sidi so Bhatia at Penn applied word to vec and some of these other vector representation tools to the Linda bank, Linda bank teller case. Uh, he gave them the Linda description. And you'll see here that um, bank teller got really low scores, whereas feminist bank teller got much higher scores. Higher scores right? So Batia suggests that um, maybe what we have are these internal vector representations, and then that explains our behavior on the, on the Linda bank teller case. This is, I think, a very sophisticated example of a kind of echo chamber, right? Where uh, we have these kinds of computational models in uh, now in AI of certain kinds of meaning representations and people in psychology are now looking back at them and saying, well, maybe that's the way that we do it without perhaps thinking so carefully about the ways in which these vector representations might be different from actual meaning, and under meaning understanding. So if you look a little bit closer, things uh, start to look more complicated. So while with some kinds of, uh, some kinds of um, problems, these vector representations do very well, like comparative adjectives, young is to younger is white is to whiter. If you look down at the bottom, the probability that they'll get a C uh, SAT questions on the first, the, the one that they think is the number one candidate for being answered, it's 1%, right? And then if you, if you let it give you its top 20 answers, that uh, probability goes up to 10%. So it's extremely unreliable at SAT questions, which we would think of as sort of, you know, the SAT is problematic in all sorts of ways, but we would think of it as getting a meaningful problem in a way that mere comparative adjectives system. So I think we should be really sort of hesitant to directly attribute as potential uh, psychological underpinnings these kinds of vector representations. They work well in some cases, but not in others. Um, that is something that we should expect because we use language meaningfully. So of course, a system that is trained up on similarity, uh, sorry, being able to predict the words that are close in space to, uh, to your data word, um, those are going to um, have correlations, meaning, meaning correlations about meaning, right? So you're going to get certain correlations that relate to meaning because humans use language meaningfully. <laughs> But we shouldn't think that that kind of training up necessarily gives us insight into the underpinnings of intelligence, right? So the way the solving of certain kinds of analogical problems might be a kind of side effect of the way these systems are trained up, not something deep about meaning representation itself. Okay. I promised you an FX punchline. Well, people are already starting to use these vector representations in um, social justice contexts. They're trying to use them to make fairness assessments and other things like that. If you take this super reductive approach, you might not be looking out for the ways in which these representations characteristically fail and it could have real harms on people. But if you take a kind of practical emergence approach like I've been motivating throughout the talk, then you can see, well, maybe vector representations are good for specific contexts or specific problems. And there's no issue with using them there but we should seek to understand the conditions where they're gonna fail and try to compensate for them. So I think the kind of practical emergence approach helps us keep a sharp eye out for, not, uh, for both the cases where certain representations are gonna help us succeed in our aims, but also that uh, it's gonna help us keep in mind that um, those successes are always context specific and we're gonna be on the lookout for characteristic failure and hopefully prevent a lot of damage that um, is likely going to be done 
to um, to people as a result of the use of this technology. Okay, so that is, I'm gonna skip this and just close. So um, I'm just, that's basically it. I'm just going to remind you of what I did. Um, I made the case for taking a kind of stance of practical emergence in intelligence research. Um, I explained what that was and provided some kind of general motivation for this. I suggested that our problem is one of sort of spanning variable scales, where we have these sort of uh, scales of more local scales of internal representations and more local features of the body and the environment. And what we're trying to understand is this kind of robust relational uh, capacity that we have as intelligent beings. I introduced a kind of generative, what I call the generative framework to show you that this approach has real scientific teeth and can um, end up giving you rigorous, um, uh, rigorous explanatory program. And then I suggested how a kind of uh, thinking about things in terms of the generative framework and the stance of practical emergence helps us look out for and avoid these echo chambers. It helps us look out for ways in which we might not actually be getting at the sort of underpinnings of intelligence, but we might just be uh, circling the same kinds of theories back and forth. Um, and lastly, I explained hopefully why, uh, why this work is practically important and not just full of philosophy of science. So thanks so much. Um, I'll stop my screen so that I can see people. Um, and I think what I, so there are some, I thought I saw some hands raised on, how should we do the queue? So, um, are you, can you control, can you control the screen? Uh-huh. <clears throat> well, why don't, why don't you, well, since you're in front of the camera, why don't you call, call, for, call, call on me? Okay. Um, um. Uh, are there questions people have? Um, I have a question that yeah. I want to refer to. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm not familiar with this sort of research whatsoever. Okay. But, um, I mean, you're talking about intelligent systems, you're talking about a number of different capacities and activities reasoning, perception, emotion, and so on. <laughs> and it seemed like you know, one underlying uh, way of analyzing the representation. The way that these internal representations of certain practices successfully. It made me wonder about whether there are aspects of the politics that need to have an internal representation or some perhaps there's a different kind of logic to it. I mean, just because we were. And so I was thinking about dramatic performances and fictional, say, you know, you're um, trying to understand Anyway, but this is not, I think we're probably messing with the other question. Is there something like, um, does this approach to uh, intelligence allow for uh, activities that they don't fit the model of under representation? Yeah, yeah. Before you answer, um, they can't hear him okay. speaking, so can you repeat the gist of the question? Yeah. Or the... 
Yeah, so this does not do justice to Rob's question at all. But the, the, the way I would, I would sort of rephrase your question is um, some kinds of intelligence that seems are manifest in certain kinds of performances, say dramatic performances. And does the kind of approach that I provide, can that um, accommodate or help us to understand those kinds of cases? And I wanna say, yes, That's, it's actually what it's designed to do. So the, uh, although I try to give in, in lots of these arguments, I try to give as much over to, the, to my opponent as, as possible. Um, the sort of standard way of thinking about intelligence is that you have some sort of internal processes and some special sauce is what makes those really intelligent. And then behavior is intelligent because it's appropriately caused by this intelligent reasoning or planning or something like that. That's the kind of standard function. Um, I, I like to think of myself as a kind of neo rileyan in that I think that intelligence is manifest in behavior in the first instance. And it's not due to some sort of special features of internal processing that makes something intelligent. The way I want to think about it is intelligence is meaningful engagement with the environment. And sometimes um, that need not involve overt action. You can meaningfully, you, you all meaningfully engage with the talk without having to move at all, right? So meaningful engagement is a kind of relationality to your environment or to the world more broadly um, that need not be overt. But often is, and the most fundamental instances are overt. Um, I gave a, I might not surprise you because I gave some evolutionary sort of examples and motivation in my talk, but when we think about the sort of evolutionary basis of intelligence, they're intelligent actions. They're meaningful, avoiding predators, seeking food, things like that. And so um, if we're thinking about what intelligence is as this kind of meaningful engagement, that can be engagement in overt behavior or not. And indeed the overt behavior is the basic case. And so I think that that kind of inverts the explanatory priority. <laughs> it's no longer the internal representations that endow behavior with intelligence. Rather, um, the cognition is a kind of non-overt <laughs> meaningful engagement. Um, where the paradigm case is, is behavior. Yeah, yeah. Um, Candace has a question. Oh, Candace has a question, and then I also see Jeff. Um. Okay, um, so ever since Rodney Brooks, we haven't talked about the need for representation in order to be able to manipulate the environment or engage in the environment, right? Because that was that was the whole big move right then. So now we're talking about how we understand, how we frame, because there's something about semantics that has to be involved, right? Because otherwise we're not gonna converge on things. We're not gonna make the conceptual state space necessary to be able to make any kind of um, correct or any kind of ethical decision. So um, now another thing I just want to pull in is um, there's a big distinction that Nancy Cartwright makes between what is um, an explanation and what we call a cause of something. And she's she's always like given this under kind of underpinning differences that, so I like the idea very, very, very much of practical uh, emergence because what you're talking about, I mean, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, that's the question. Um, wh what I'm asking is, is what you're talking about is all of the underpinnings and the things that, that just might cancel each other out or they might work different ways actually don't matter when it gets to the level of asking questions that we can responsibly address about, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter about finding the, the analogy between Paris and France and Berlin and, 
and asking ethical questions. So um, your 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 claim, I I think, is right that um, it in order for something to be intelligent doesn't have to be intelligent on the human model. And I don't even know if we have representation, so I'm not even there. So the bottom line is for you, intelligence just is well, maybe maybe what I'm asking you is like what is it what does it mean to you to to say intelligence in the face of making use of the affordances in the environment in the way that you've talked about and how it doesn't actually matter what cancels out but we can we don't have to give the same explanations for our for our decisions to put something in a category as an artificial intelligence might have to give for putting something in the same category or in the same matrix. That was that was a very complicated question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, no, it's great. And I had a few pieces, so I'm going to try to address all of them. Um, but let me know if, if if I left something out. So on the Brooks, so on on sort of initial Brooks point. So Rodney Brooks is this roboticist who famously um, claimed that we we could program we that there was an over reliance on internal representations, and that we should really be thinking about the um, uh, intelligence and sort of competent engagement with your environment. And he, uh, so I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, the way Brooks thinks about architectures. Because what he thought about intelligence architectures was that you should try to get a robot to work doing some really stupid thing, like avoiding damage to itself. And then you add behaviors onto it. And so the architecture is driven by the things that the agent can do. Um, and that I think is 100% right. I think it's evolutionary plausible. I think people have sort of lost, there isn't enough focus on that as there should be. And I think part of it is because Brooks was an anti-representationalist through and through. So to use my terminology, he was an anti-representationalist, not only about the agent level, but also about the basis level. And there, I think you limit yourself <laughs> because I think we need representations to be able to um, uh, build systems that have the kind of complex behaviors that we want. It's just that those representations are not gonna be identical to what we think of in terms of human level or intelligent agential perceptual experiences or reasoning and so on. So part of this project, you know, part of this project can be seen as Neo-Rylian and part of it can be seen as sort of Neo-Brooksian <laughs> in the sense of like, let's bring back thinking about um, architectures in terms of these capacities for engagement with the world and what, how does that change how we, how we build our systems. But I wanna make room for representations in a way that's non-threatening <laughs> to that kind of project because they're not even candidates for being intelligent. Um, mental states or reasoning. Or there, there can't, they're actually, let me put that the other way. They're candidates, but only, you know, hard empirical, uh, making a hard empirical case that those underlying things just are the higher level intelligence representations. That case needs to be made. So they're candidates, but they're not the only candidate. Um, so, Part of why, I mean, so I, I talked about this a little bit when, when I was talking about the brittleness of representational systems. But like, if you have a system that really the causal behavior is, you know, we think about, there's a the classic model, you have like something hits your sensors, your light sensors, then there's some computation that gets done on that. That, we call that a belief together with a desire, we output the intention and then that causes the output of behavior. If we think about it as that kind of linear model, then we're thinking about the representations as really causally determinative of the behavior of the system. That I think is makes for, and I have a paper actually on the frame problem for artificial intelligence that argues for this, is makes for sort of brittle systems that work great in super specialized cases, but then fail 
when the, they have to deal with real world environments. If instead we're thinking about underlying representations as coordinated with each other and the body and the environment so they compensate with each other, then intervening on the lower level uh, stuff isn't necessarily going to take out <laughs> your ability to robustly, intelligently engage with the world. And so if we're thinking about the distinction between you know, our causal explanations and the underpinnings of them, the, the mechanisms that underlie them, this distinction becomes super important for intelligent systems because you can't assume that you can read off the causal explanations from the underlying mechanisms. The higher level robust causal explanations are in some ways abstractions from the lower level processing. Um, no, gotcha. Great. No, I, I just asked like way too many questions in one question. Human. No, gotcha. yeah, no worries. I, but I think I, I can answer your third. So I, I think your third question was about like, when we think about representations in, in humans, like what is that, how is that related? And I think when we talk about representations in humans, I want to be really careful not to collapse those two computational representations. So if you want to talk, I don't quite like talking about it this way, but people do a lot talking about um, you know, perceptual experience as a representation of the environment or knowledge as some kind of representation of the world. Um, whatever representations those are, are not, oh, I think this is freezing. Uh, what, okay, I think we're back. Um, just to say, whatever representations those are, they're not, you know, they're not symbolic representations that have the kinds of formal properties that the underlying computational representations have. Um, so we should keep them distinct. Um, that's the main claim I wanna make. Hopefully they're back soon. Yeah, I think we're now in a cloud. <laughs> I know, I, I don't know where we are right now because they lost us. Something like a cloud maybe. Yeah, and we're being recorded. <laughs> Does this count as AI taking over or? It could be, but not by representation. Dave is texting me to find out what's going on. Jeff, what was your question? Dave just wants to know, are we, have we, can we hear anything? Can they hear us? It doesn't sound like it. Jeff, what were you gonna ask? Well, I, I was gonna preface it by saying it's a bit of a selfish question because I don't think I have the, the apparatus to, to, to speak about the same concepts, but you know, she mentioned something about- Hi, uh, wait, 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 I've got Celeste's oh. phone now, so I can hear your question. <laughs> uh, shall I go or- no, I, go I ahead. Gabe also no, go question. ahead. Oh, so I, yeah, so I was actually just, uh, thank you. I was just prefacing by saying that I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't know if I have the same 
um, apparatus to talk about it in the terms that you were using, but you used a metaphor that I kind of liked about the echo chamber. And um, I, I'm not sure if I got the criticism right, but something stuck out to me. Uh, and I wonder if you can speak more about uh, whether what kind of problems might be involved in using the, uh, the human intelligence as a model for understanding intelligence in general. So because we're coming from our perspective, is there any issues that might arise from that? And you mentioned very tantalizingly that you thought animals might have something to add to this. I'm not sure if that meant that they are wrong to be excluded or that animals might be a different kind of model to use. Um, so that was one, one question I had. Yeah. Um, thanks so much. So could everyone hear? No. Um, so the question is about uh, animal intelligence. So I sort of gestured at the idea that I think non-human animals are intelligent and uh, could they potentially have a different kind of intelligence than our intelligence? And yes. So part of the book project um, motivates a kind of pluralism about intelligence. So if we think of intelligence not as sort of a standard as a kind of problem solving, abstract problem solving, the way a lot of AI people think about it. Um, <laughs> but if we think about it, okay, as a kind of, uh, if you just, it looks like this is, oh, is it back? Yeah, I think this is. Oh, cool. Oh, well, it's all right, just keep going. Okay. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Okay. No. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> we need smarter AI. Um, but uh, uh, if you think about intelligence as essentially the capacity to meaningfully engage with the world, of course, there are myriad different ways of meaningfully engaging with the world. And the idea that you would find a kind of strict ordering of them or is sort of like doesn't look too promising from the from the start. Of course, abstract problem solving might be one way of meaningfully engaging, but um, but there might be many others that aren't sort of strictly comparable. Um, I do think that a lot of animals exhibit intelligence. Um, oh, another thing, except chickens are really stupid. I feel <laughs> chickens are really, really stupid. <laughs> I, I uh, you know, I wanna be respectful of all the vegetarians and vegans in the room. I used to be vegan, but I feel way bad, less bad about eating them um, now that I own some. But we just have, we just eat their eggs. Um, anyways, they're fun. Uh, but even chickens can do things that our current robots cannot do. Like even the way they move their head, like part of, you know, there are people in grass who are working really hard to understand how chickens move their head and, and how that stabilizes perception and how that, you know, so. Um, we can in even include chickens among intelligent systems. <laughs> um, but part of why I think the kind of generative approach is really helpful is it imports this kind of context specificity. So when we think about intelligence in one system, um, what underlies it might be different in other kinds of systems. So octopi, for example, are, um, Exam are intelligent systems that can problem solve. Um, they can do things that really like are, <laughs> are demonstratively problem solving, but how they do that, what their perspective is on their environment, that is a really open question because we know that their nervous systems are very distributed. So they have like big like balls of, you know, parts of their nervous systems in each um, arm and also a central one, but we don't know what it would be like to be a system that engages with the world when you're that decentralized. So um, maybe it wouldn't make a change at all. It's hard to tell to sort of the octop octopus's perspective, but I think we should leave open that there are some really fundamental uh, important differences between um, different kinds of intelligences. So yes, it's a long winded way of saying yes. Can I uh, interject and ask a, ba a basic question? Because um, I came a little bit late um, and uh, I was picking up my children. And so I, I came a little bit late and I'm not, I, this is obviously not my area of expertise and I'm not very um, current on this notion of representation and non-representationality. So if you could tell me a little bit about what we mean by representation here, because you were saying that intelligence is kind of this semantic 
so it's, it's some kind of meaningful connections that are made, but that don't need representation. Does that mean they don't need concepts or believe? Or what, what exactly are we talking about uh, when you say that? Um, I, and I'm and maybe I'll have a follow up. I'm kind of motivated by this just because if it's just or rather, what do we mean by meaning then? Can I can I uh, describe the the flow of water over the rock, filing the rock as it moves through it as meaningful because it's it's doing something that I can perceive to be you know um, different from the way water behaves in other contexts. Um, is that meaning then, or or are we, or do we need something more sophisticated to talk about meaning, but yet non-representational? In what way is it non-representational? So if you could like clarify those things for me a little bit, just yeah, sure. You were talking to an eight-year-old because I am. <laughs> no, 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 um, no. There, this is complex stuff, and there's no no easy question. So the question was about like what I mean by representation in, in the talk, and. When I talk about representations, I'm really talking about computational representations. So these are vehicles who have, um, uh, so the way, the way I think it's best to define a computational system. A computational system is a system that you can causally characterize just in terms of its proximal inputs, its proximal outputs, and its internal workings. And so either you give a sort of physical explanation of how the system works, or you give some sort of abstraction on the physical explanation. So this would be like ones and zeros is an abstraction of electrical current running or not running. The important thing about representations is that their causal powers are determined by their formal properties. So although you can ascribe meaning to the states of the system, it's not the meaning that makes the system do what it does. A computer by definition is one that you can formally characterize the functional workings of the system. And so um, when I, so when we talk about, so we could use the language, I, I sort of prefer not to, but I'm fine using the language of representation talking about um, sort of goals and purposes and so on. If, if all you mean by representation is that you have say a propositional attitude, um, that's fine. But those propositional attitudes are not representations in the computationalist sense, the way people in AI are talking about them. And it's this conflation between this sort of intelligent, uh, the characterization of intelligent systems as representational in sort of your sense versus um, representational systems in the computational sense, this conflation has created a whole bunch of problems. And so my project is about trying to rigorously tease these apart so that we can study how they're related. Um, so it's hard, I think um, Michael has a hand. I did, yes, thank you. Um, I just, if you could elaborate a little more on the idea of meaningful engagement with the environment is is there a place in that for understanding or is that replaced with like maybe goal seeking as a as a substitute or or am i just way out of left field on that yeah no um no i think i think you're tracking i mean yes so there is a place for understanding and i think that there are um there are two important ways I want to think about understanding. So the first one is, so I think cases of purposeful behavior are the most basic cases of intelligence, um, but they're not the only cases. I want to include, you know, abstract mathematics as intelligent behavior as well. Um, and so in any kind of purposeful behavior, I think there's a kind of practical understanding that is inherent in that purposeful behavior. So when my dog plays fetch. Actually, she's not very good at, my cat is much better at playing fetch than my dog is. When my cat plays fetch with me, she has a kind of practical understanding of, you know, where the toy is going to go and that it's the target of her behavior. And she brings it back to me at, you know, as the thrower of the next, the next throw and so on. And so there's a kind of practical understanding of the world that just comes along with actually being able to 
have purposes and, and goals in this meaningful sense. Tyler Burge has this distinction that I think is really useful between um, psychological agency and biological agency, where uh, biological agency is just, you can ascribe like drives and goals to a system in virtue of what's conducive for survival and reproduction, but that might not have anything to do with the perspective <laughs> that that system has on the world, whereas psychological agency has to do with the perspective of the system. So I think, and what I'm talking about when I'm talking about meaningful engagement is this kind of um, per where, where the agent engages with goals and purposes as a matter of like her perspective in acting. <laughs> Those goals are figure into her perspective. And so I think there's a kind of understanding that's inherent to that. And then I think we kind of build up and get more abstract as we go sort of as, as um, systems get more complex and more capable. So understanding, having a kind of, for example, theoretical understanding of what, um, uh, well, let me, let me say something about knowledge because I want to say something similar about understanding, but I've thought more about knowledge. So what is it to know on this kind of picture? Well, it's to be in a certain relation to the fact. And that relation involves all sorts of kind of counterfactuals like, um, you know, the ability to, you know, reason if you're presented with counter evidence and that sort of thing. So um, knowledge that P is a kind of uh, relation, a kind of grasp of the facts that entails a whole network of what the system would be disposed to do in certain kinds of uh, instances and so on, which is why we can't think of knowledge just as a kind of internal representation uh, that P, knowledge is a way of relating to the, to the world. And I want to say something similar about understanding as well, um, that understanding, when you understand, I don't know, you understand football, um, you have a kind of way of relating to the game that is this kind of complex relational thing. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think that'll actually be our last question. But uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining by Zoom and uh, thanks to our in-person uh, audience. And for the last thing we do, let's thank our speaker for this excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I'm not in a position to make any announcements, but I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. So I hope this is the beginning of um, you know, getting to know each other and doing some philosophy. So thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. All right. Um, I'm going to end it.